My name is Father Kyle Mano. I'm 30 years old and I've been a priest for just over a year. And I gotta say, if I would have known that I would be standing here today talking about the fact that I'm a priest of Jesus Christ, I would have never believed that in a million years. In fact, growing up, I grew up a cradle Catholic, born, baptized, confirmed. But I was definitely that kid in the pews who went to CCD, religious education, and didn't want to be there. And so my idea of mass and church growing up was that place that I go to, I sit in the pews, and I'm bored for an hour. And I'm wondering, when do I get to go home? And in fact, as I went through that religious education, the same thing. I would go into the classroom, I would listen to the teacher and wonder, when do I get to go home? And so I was not necessarily the one who loved the church growing up. And actually, when I went to high school, I started asking, why am I even Catholic? And so I started visiting other churches. I visited my local Lutheran church, Baptist church, Methodist, non-denominational, asking the question, why am I Catholic? And after checking them all out, still didn't know why, but I remember just thinking, something feels different in this Catholic church. And so I go off to college and my plan is I'm going to go and get a music degree and then perform professional music and then one day also teach. So I go to college, I start studying music education and I start thinking, should I go to church? And I remember going to school the first day thinking, I don't have to. Nobody's telling me I have to go to church. I don't have any parents anymore who live in the home telling me to wake up on Sunday. As so I remember walking around the convocation event with all the different tables for the lacrosse team and the soccer team and the chess club, and then I saw a Catholic booth. And there were some people at the booth very cheery and excited handing out pamphlets for the church. So I took one and kept walking. And I remember looking at it, and all of a sudden this voice popped in my mind. And it was my mom. And I knew she was going to ask me, are you going to Mass? And so I looked at the Mass times and I thought, I'll just check them out. And so I saw Saturday, 4.30 p.m. And I thought, nope, not going then. I saw 9 a.m. on Sunday, I thought, I'll be sleeping, I'm in college. I saw 10.30 a.m. on Sunday. I'll still be sleeping, I'm in college. I saw noon on Sunday. I thought, I'll still be sleeping, I'm in college. But then I saw the last mass time, 9 p.m. I thought, oh, I'm awake for that one. I'm awake for 9 p.m. And so I guess I have no choice but to go to church because I know my mom's gonna ask me and I don't wanna lie about church. And so I remember walking by myself that first Sunday to Mass, by myself on the street. And I got to Mass and I remember for the first time in my entire life, the priest came out and he started preaching. And I saw a priest who loved being a priest. And I stepped back and I thought, what? Priests can be happy? Priests can be joyful? And so I started enjoying going to Mass and I finally started learning about the amazing parts of our faith. So I went back to church, I went back to confession, back to the sacraments, and again, still got my plan, what I wanna do, teach music, perform music. And so two big things happened in my life that made me realize I was made to be a priest. So out of those two big things, one of those big events that happened was I was playing in a band and we would gig around different parts of the state and parts of the country, and we would play shows about three or four times a week. And one day we were playing a local show, and I remember playing piano and playing guitar, and all of a sudden, this man walked into the bar and he sat down right at the front. And as he was sitting there, I remember watching him, and for some reason, I was intrigued by who he was. And he was sitting there talking, and you can tell this guy who came in, he's the guy everyone knows. It's Mike. You know, get Mike the usual. Everyone knows Mike. He's here every Friday and every Saturday. 
and he was talking to the bartender, talking to the woman next to him. And all of a sudden, as I saw and I caught his eyes, I remember looking at him and thinking, man, that guy looks empty. That guy looks lost. He looks like he's searching. And all of a sudden, a voice popped in my mind and it said, yeah, he's like a sheep without a shepherd. And all of a sudden I thought, yes, that's exactly what that man is. He's, search, he's searching, he's lost, he wants love, he wants mercy, he wants joy, but he doesn't know where to go. And so he comes here over and over and over again to the same bar every Friday, every Saturday, because he wants happiness and he thinks he'll get it here. But he's a sheep, he's got no one to tell him where to go. And so I thought, who's gonna help this poor man? Who's gonna help him find actual truth and joy? If no one helps him, he'll be here forever. And all of a sudden, a voice popped in my mind and it said, what about you? And in that moment, I recognized that the question I was asking to be a priest wasn't just a question, but it was very deep inside of me that I had this deep desire to bring people who were lost and searching to God to show them the actual truth. And then the second thing that truly changed my life and had me decide that I needed to go to seminary was I had this huge fear. And the fear was of loneliness. I was afraid that one day if I became a priest, that I would be so alone. In fact, I imagined myself, what if I got ordained, gave my life to God, and what if I wake up in 50 years in a bed by myself, old, miserable, decrepit, and alone, no wife, no kids, and I die? And I thought, ah, God, if, if that's being a priest, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be alone. And so one day I was in the chapel and I was reading this book by Mother Teresa. And the beginning of chapter four just had one quote that changed my life. It said, if I make just one child happy through the love of God, isn't it worth everything? And all of a sudden I recognized that God, I don't know what the future looks like. I don't know what priesthood will look like, but if I can help one person go from hell to heaven forever, then sign me up, I'll go. And then secondly, I realized is if God made me for something, then God did not make me for misery, depression, and loneliness. No, that would be a mean God. Or rather, if God created me to be a priest, then he will make my life incredible and I will experience so much joy. And so I said, God, I'll go. And so I finally decided to go to seminary. I joined and every day of seminary was a greater day. Every day was a day more full of God's love. And in those short six years and now one year of being a priest, I can honestly say that I would have never been able to plan out such incredible life except for if God gave it to me. And that's all we're called to do, is give God our entire lives. And when we give him everything, he fills us up and gives us everything in return. Father, welcome to Volcari. Thank you so much for, you know, accepting our invitation to be part of this show. Well, it's a joy to be here. I love the priesthood and I love the church, so. Whatever I can do for it, the better. You've been a priest for a year. One year, I'm a baby priest, yeah. brand new, right out of the <laughs> womb of the church, brand new priest. Tell us about your ordination, how was it? Yeah, my ordination uh, was honestly the greatest day of my life. And so as a priest, you have two ordinations. You of course have first diaconate, where really that's where you sign on the dotted line. Because prior to that, throughout all of seminary, you can leave at anytime you want. If you want to walk out the door, go ahead. But the second you become a deacon, you are literally giving your life forever for God and the church. And I remember the day of my deacon ordination, I just was on a roller coaster of emotions from how is this happening to why did God pick me? How did he allow me to share in this gift to tears of joy, to tears of um, just ecstatic love for the Lord? And I remember feeling so full of God's love on the day I became a deacon, that honestly, for a second, I thought if I'm any happier, I would have to be dead and in heaven. I really thought that like, I would need a different resurrected body to be so loved by God. It was miraculous. And so I got ordained a deacon, and then I was able to serve for the next year. 
And then again, my priesthood ordination, just being so conformed to the Lord and really feeling like him saying, I just choose you and I'm going to be your spouse and I'm going to love you and you have nothing to be afraid of. And it was, it was incredible. I couldn't, words can't even put it into anything from what I felt in my heart. The parish I'm at right now is very vibrant. We have 5,000 families and these are families of four or five children. So we even have two churches, two physical locations with 10 masses on the weekend. And then when we do a baptism, we do baptisms two or three times a month. There's like 10 babies at once. So you're just, you're going down the line and dunking children just over and over again to get them baptized. And then visiting the hospitals, preaching every day on the weekends, visiting the sick, visiting the homebound. I'm also getting to do so many weddings just in this one year. I've probably already done about 20 weddings and I get to meet with each of those couples, you know, many times. And a big thing I love doing uh, very often is evangelizing. And so I love going to Walmart or Sam's Club in my priest clothes. I wear this all the time. Even if I'm going shopping, I put this on and I'm like, let's bring Jesus to Walmart. If I'm getting hummus, Jesus is coming with me. And so I go right there and it's amazing because whether or not a person loves a priest or hates a priest, loves the church or hates the church, the second they see this collar, they already have some sort of idea, a preconceived notion of who I am and what I represent. And so whether it's good or bad, they're intrigued. And so really the beauty of this, this outward sign that I wear as a priest is something that people are drawn to and intrigued by. And then when I speak to them, they're willing to dialogue. And so even as I'm checking out at the line of Walmart, if I say to somebody, how are you? They're actually going to tell me because they're intrigued. And if they trust God, then God willing they'll trust us as priests. And so this happens every day. It just happened yesterday. I was at Walmart and this woman's pouring out her soul. And by the end of it, I'm praying over her in the middle of Walmart. She's checking out my food and I'm blessing her. And then what often happens is then I'm meeting with the person a few days later. And so a big part of this last year has been really trying to go out into the world and bring people into the truth of the faith and remind them that there is no place too dark where the Lord will not go. There is no place too far that he will not travel to seek you out. He is seeking us out and people need to hear that and we cannot be afraid to share it. And so, so much of this year is bringing that truth out to the world and then also empowering the people of God who are in the church to tell them they have to be ambassadors. It's the people in the pews, the lay faithful that do the work. They're the ones evangelizing all the major corporations. They're the ones evangelizing the baseball teams, the soccer teams, and the schools. That's them. I see you, what you have been doing, Father. You're actually going to where people are at, meeting mm -hmm. them there, and not just waiting for them to come to the church and say, okay, this is Mass for Sunday, and then I'll see you next week. You are basically bringing Jesus. You're like his ambassador. Please, Father, uh, Kyle, bring me to my people. That's really the prayer I make every day as I'm going out there and even as I'm preaching, even at mass, I always remind myself in prayer is even if I have the most poetic, most beautiful words, if they're not the words of God, they will never change anyone's heart ever. And so yeah, I love going out into the community and being that ambassador for the Lord because Jesus Christ, he's in that tabernacle. He's in there, he's staying there. The only way he's gonna reach the people out there in the world is if we receive that Eucharist, receive that sacrament and bring it to them. And so even when I go to the gym and go work out, I'm in casual clothes because of course it'd be a little strange to be you know, lifting weights in priest clothes. Hey, could you spot me back there, you know? And so I wear casual clothes, t-shirt, shorts, gym shoes. And even when I go there, slowly people are discovering I'm a priest because parishioners will come over, the workers, and I love planting seeds and then allowing the person's mind uh, to really be blown. What I mean by that is when people see their idea of priest often is this old man who's kind of hunched over, doesn't necessarily smile that often, maybe looks unhappy. In fact, that was my idea of a priest growing up my entire life 
was that priest is the one you're kind of far from. He's not very happy and he's old and he does his thing. And so then when people see a young priest who's maybe happy, they're like, something in their brain goes, that doesn't compute. You know, how's that possible in the priesthood? And so then often I like going to like those places, even in casual clothes, like the gym, and letting people see I'm a normal guy. And then when I tell them I'm a priest, they kind of step back and go, whoa, no, you're not a priest. You're here, you know, lifting weights with us, or you're here boxing with us. How could you be a priest? And that's the idea of Jesus Christ. He's hidden among us, and we can't be afraid to reveal him. And so, yes, Jesus should live in the gym. Jesus should live at Walmart. Jesus should live wherever you work. He's got to be there. If he's not present, then the presence of God is not becoming more part of our world. So often, we are afraid to be ourselves. And so, for example, every priest doesn't have to be super excited, super you know, exuberant or this or that. That priest is called to be the exact man authentically that God called him to be. And if he does that, he's going to set the world on fire. Fire. Same with the lay faithful in the pews. If that man or that woman, that husband, that wife, if they truly authentically become who they're called to be, it's going to change the world. And so we can only become authentically us if we're authentic in prayer. So, so often when I go to prayer, I tell the Lord, if I'm having a bad day, I have to tell him. If I'm having a stressful day where I don't want to go out there and maybe it's difficult to go and I hear I have to walk into a situation where somebody just died and I don't know them. I just walk into someone's home, this stranger priest, and I have to enter into the most deepest part of their broken heart. So I have to authentically tell the Lord, that scares me. So you have to show up. And then I have to remind people, we have to do this all the time. We cannot hide even in prayer. And so that big part of your heart where you lost your loved one, when your father died, you have to tell the Lord, I am angry. I'm upset about that, Lord. Even though I know and I've been hearing my entire life that you're a good and loving God, I don't feel it right now. I think you stole my loved one. Or when your marriage is falling apart, we have to say to God authentically, God, I can't save this. You have to. And so we cannot be afraid to be authentic in prayer because when we hide, when we try to be something we're not, God can't communicate. God can only love us in the truth and only in truth can we actually receive love. Just a few weeks ago, we uh, did 16 hours, about 12 to 16 hours of confession. Everyone in the entire diocese, every priest, every church heard confessions all day. And so in one day, I probably heard a hundred people and their most broken parts of their heart, their sufferings, and this happens every day. And so there's that real burden of watching people's brokenness and you just want them to be so loved by God and you want them to be so healed. So that when you really go to the sacraments, when you go to mass and you raise the chalice, there's this burden of like, I have to be a priest for the people. This is not about me. This is about people's souls. God is not a God who desires us to walk around with our sins for months, for a year, for at times 50 years. No, that would be a mean God. If God didn't have confession, we'd have to sit with our burden until the moment we're 80 or 90 and maybe dead. Like, that would be a tragedy. No, God wants to free us right now. And so if somebody is in this place of struggle, like I'm too scared to go, Fear is always a tool of the devil. And perfect love, which is Jesus Christ, casts out all fear. And when I see a person walk into confession, they're scared. When they walk out, they are a free human being walking out of a jail. And you can see them like soaring away. It's, it's incredible. How do you unwind? What are your interests? What are you passionate about? So I love music. 
I'm a big, uh, big into music. I play piano and trumpet and harmonica and guitar. So I studied music in college. So I love doing that. I also really enjoy reading as well as um, I like to go to the gym. I like to sit down with the other priests and watch sports or maybe watch uh, like a comedy show like The Office or Parks and Recreation is a funny show. And then also, you know, in my prior life, I also was like in a breakdance hip hop group in college. And so I love like when there's family parties or weddings, like in the family, I love those events because I, I don't mind going out there and you know, breaking some moves down. And so I love doing that as well. And so um, I've got a, different, a lot of different hobbies. And so I just love getting to kind of unwind. And even those hobbies, uh, the Lord is never absent. He's always in the midst of those events. You know? You know, growing up, I was always in music and acting and musicals and plays. And really, it was through those moments that then becoming a priest, I looked back on my life and saw, wow, Jesus called me to acting. Jesus called me to music, not for it to be an end in itself, but rather because he was prepping me to be able to stand up in front of people at Mass every day and speak to them. I want to glorify God. So God gave me gifts, how do I glorify him? And he took them all, and now instead of them being channeled for me or for somebody else, they're all for him, his love, his ministry, and for the people of God. My joy, my humor, my music, all those things. And running marathons and traveling a lot. Tell us about it, Father. Yes, I was blessed to run two marathons. I put it on my bucket list, so I have a bucket list. Go see the Pope, be a Guinness World Record holder, that's not gonna happen. Run a marathon. So I had this long list. So when I was in seminary, some nuns in Chicago, they run every year the marathon. And one of them is like, runs it like a five and a half minute mile. These are intense nuns. And so they said, do you wanna run the marathon for us? I said, well, it's on my bucket list. If I don't sign up now, I might never do it. And so yeah, I signed up, I trained, I ran the marathon for them two years in a row and raised money. And even that was like a spiritual event, getting to like be among thousands of people all for this common purpose of running this marathon. So if you're a basketball player, awesome. Be the most holy basketball player there is in this world. If you're um, a magician, be the holiest magician there is. If you're a mom, be the holiest mom there is. God does not want to remove who you are. He wants to only exemplify it all the more. Bless us, O Lord, and these gifts which you're about to receive from that about to be Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, speaking of authenticity, mm -hmm. you were so authentic with that carpool karaoke, the spoof that you did. I was, I was watching it and I was laughing, and I'm sure that's why it went viral, because people saw how authentic you and Father uh, Romke were, mm -hmm. and you had Bishop Malloy in the car. Tell us about it. How was it made? Who, who thought about that brilliant idea? Yeah, so it was definitely... Um, something fun to do, and a, such a grace to be able to do with my spiritual father, the bishop. You know, that's a, you don't get to do that every day. You know, drive around in a car and sing Go Cubs Go with him, you know. Go Cubs Go! And so we were doing a big youth conference called a Youth Summit. We've done it last four years in a row in the diocese, and it gets about 2,000 youth to this event. We do it once a year. And each year we always try to just do something creative to kind of engage them with the bishop. And so one year we did like a game show, and we had a boys team, a girls team, and then a team with the bishop, and we had trivia. And then last year we were asking, what do we do this year? And so somebody came up with the idea to do the carpool karaoke, present the video, and then it would lead into basically doing late night uh, with Father Mano and Bishop Malloy. And so then we did like a sit down, kind of like Jimmy Fallon talking to an interviewer. We did that with the bishop. And so we had emailed the bishop and we sent him some links 
to the James Corden Carl Pierre karaoke that he does with many celebrities. And we said, Bishop, what do you think? And he is such an amazing bishop, and he knows like the necessity to bring Jesus to the culture that he said, yeah, I'm totally on board. And so it was all the Holy Spirit. I mean, we met in the morning. I had kind of prayed about what songs and what questions to kind of ask. And then we just got in the car and cameras rolled and we just drove around. And the big thing was, yeah, not being afraid to recognize that anything in the world can be used for Jesus Christ's evangelization and love. And so if it's music, if it's dancing, if it's laughter, if it's joy, if it's going to, you know, Culver's and eating, you know, ice cream, all those things can be joyful and shown that, look, priests can be normal. Priests can laugh. Priests can be joyful. And so it was such a grace. And then we really, you know, posted it online and the diocese put it up and it just very quickly People started seeing it over and over and over and over again. And it was such a tool to help bring people into the church, non-Catholics and Catholics. Process and not only the were they talking about the video, but they were emailing me with really questions, to to like, how do I receive joy? How do I find happiness? I left the church 20 years ago and I, I saw this video and for so long I thought I couldn't talk to a priest, but maybe I can talk to you. And so really the Lord used it not just for this seven minutes of, you know, joy and look priests are normal, but also to really bring people back to the church. Wow, yeah. Father, that was a very powerful evangelization tool. Yeah, and that's what I discovered was the power of social media is so crucial because you can post one thing online and communicate with the entire world. I mean, we live in a time where the Lord wants us to reach the edge of the world with social media and not be afraid to use everything at our disposal to bring people into dialogue, because that's really where the rubber hits the road when we're sitting down one-on-one. -on -one. Father, thank you so much for all the insights you've shared mm -hmm. about your priesthood. Thank you. You're very I'm sure welcome. A lot of people have been inspired by your journey to the priesthood and what you're doing to reach out, evangelize, and be out there, be in the present for everyone. I pray that's the truth, and I pray if anyone ever needs to speak to a priest, they can reach any priest at their local parish or shoot me an email. They can contact me directly. All yeah. right. Thank you, Father. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Butterfinger. For all those men out there, those guys who are listening, I really encourage each one of you to not be afraid to really ask the question, could I be a priest? Because the reality is too often we just all think, I'm called to marriage. And it's true, many of us are, but we cannot be afraid as good Catholic men to always ask the question, what did God make me for? Psalm 139, 13 says you were knit in your mother's womb and you were knit for a very specific purpose. And if you do what God created you to do, you will set the world on fire and then people will simply come to watch you burn. We all desire to burn with love and joy. So I encourage you, do not be afraid and always recognize that your vocation, the plan God has for you, is the plan God created. Not the plan you did, not the plan your mother or your father or your siblings created. And so recognize this is about what God made for you. So really ask that question, God, could you possibly be calling me to the priesthood? And if so, let me not be afraid to say yes. And so now may Almighty God send his love, mercy, and goodness down upon you. Let him break open your heart to reveal to you what he created you to be. And let him show you that whatever he wants you to do in this life will make you the most joyful, the most satisfied, and the most and best version of who you are created to be in this world. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.
all of the viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you. Shalom World, God's own channel.